So good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Tejas Chopra, and thank you for joining me today for this uh, privacy preserving. There. Is this okay? Cool. Um, and um, I'll try to talk about privacy and how you can develop techniques that can allow you to compute over private data. But by no means is this an in-depth study. It is barely scratching the surface. So the goal here is that when you go back, you have topics that you can research about that can be disruptive in nature and that can also enable newer fields of research. The agenda for the talk is as follows. I'll go over a brief introduction of, about myself, what I do. Then I'll discuss uh, what exactly is privacy preserving computation and why is it important. And then we'll discuss some techniques around it that are there in the wild. So my name is Tejas. I am a senior software engineer at Netflix. When you think about Netflix, you think about the movies that are streamed. But there is movie making process as well that requires a lot of cloud infrastructure technology, especially when you think about the COVID pandemic world where people are working remotely. Traditionally, movie making was always on site. People used to go on site to work on the data just because the data was like humongous. Uh, it didn't make sense to like transfer like petabytes of data over the cloud to artists. But I work in a team that tries to make that happen. So artists can work from any corner of the world to collaborate and make a movie. That's my primary job at Netflix. Um, I am also a TEDx speaker. I speak on blockchain um, and cloud technologies. I'm an advisor to some startups, uh, Nillion being one of them. And also, I, am, I teach students about software development and blockchain. Um, my experience has been in companies like Box, Apple, Samsung, and Cadence. That was me, I think. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, I have worked primarily on cloud infrastructure and on backend systems. So the motivation behind uh, learning about privacy preserving computation comes from this diagram, actually. Uh, last year, I came to Strange Loop and I was speaking about carbon footprint awareness of software. And a lot of people told me that, you know, the blockchain that you so vociferously advocate for is also an energy guzzler. And that was fair because it uses a lot of proof of work. Now we've moved to proof of stake for some of them, but it's still an energy guzzler. But then I started looking deeper into it. There are some challenges with the blockchain, but one of the major challenges is also privacy. And the data, let's say you transfer some coins to someone, your data is not private. A anyone can look at that. Anyone can look at your transaction. Anyone can look at the wallet addresses that I've interacted. It's like giving you an email address, but someone can actually peek and look into your emails. That's the analogy that I could draw. And it's not that that uh, makes blockchain a bad technology. Blockchain is a great technology, and this is just to touch upon that. When you think about the world before the internet, you think about data. Things you can do with the data. You can either store the data, you can process the data, or you can transfer the data. What the internet allowed was taking the transfer of data out of the centralized waters. So you decentralize the transfer. What blockchain allows is decentralizing storage and inherently processing, because processing would be de decentralized if storage is decentralized. So that is why blockchain is an interesting technology. Then I started diving into what can be used to make blockchains private or data in the blockchain private. And there are blockchains that do that. That was the rabbit hole that led me to privacy preserving computation. When you think about all the things that you talk about on WhatsApp, you see end to end encrypted, but it, is it really the case? So this was a conversation that one of my friends uh, was having with me on LinkedIn. They said that on WhatsApp, they had like reached out to a friend of theirs with an interest in a credit card. And soon they were getting advertisements for the credit card on Facebook. Now, what does that mean? Like, is that data really secure and private? Um, when you look at um, the breaches that happen, uh, you'll see that around 40% of them is because the data was not secure. And it's important to understand the difference between privacy and security. It is akin to the difference between authentication and authorization. Authentication is security. Authorization is privacy. Because you can tune the amount of control that someone has to view that data. So 
This means that we are living in a world where we interact with services that keep our data. And this is what happens. You have data breaches all the time. Uh, many of you would have heard about the Uber breach that just happened recently, where their infrastructure was compromised, their Slack channels were compromised. Um, so whenever you use a service, you will end up giving your data, and that data can be breached because it is not secure and it is not private. And we've seen Equifax being breached as well. Um, so this is one end of the spectrum, where you've given your data, data is not secure. We thought, let's go to the other end of the spectrum then. Let's not give out any data. This is what happens in healthcare. So today, if you were to research on what is the impact of COVID-19 on lungs, and that's actually a picture of a patient who had COVID-19, how would you do that? The first step would be download millions of images to tra train your model. Where do you get these millions of images? You have to buy the data set from hospitals because the data is private. Now to buy, you need money. You need to get funded by a VC. You need to create a business plan. So pretty much any research on healthcare data or any research on diseases gets lost in just the collection process, the data collection process. And this is because we don't want the health data to be compromised. But are there ways in which you can still maintain the privacy of the healthcare data, but learn from them? What will happen then is, let's say Stanford Medicine Group has patients that have COVID. You can actually learn from that data, train your models, and then apply them to another hospital. That's what privacy-preserving computation can allow you to do. And because this is not happening today, we are not solving the hard problems. We cannot detect or predict diseases before they happen. We are always like running behind them, and COVID-19 is just the start. You may, there may be diseases that will come in the future that can actually be avoided if we just have a better understanding of how to share data. So it really boils down to, can we answer questions without looking at data? What does that mean for recommendations? If Amazon doesn't know that I'm buying something, how will they recommend things to me? Um, and I actually rely on those recommendations. Half the things that I buy are just from recommendations. I don't even need half the things that I have. So it's, it's a great business, and you really have to think that if I just stop that, things will not be free. We will all have to pay something to use these services. And do we really have to compromise on utility for privacy? Privacy-preserving computation allows you to get all three of them. So on the one hand of the spectrum, you have full privacy. No one can look at your data, but you get no utility. On the other end of the spectrum, you have full utility, but no privacy. We want to be somewhere in the middle. We want to compromise some privacy, but get a lot of utility as well. So in simple terms, what it allows is you own your data. No one looks at your data. No one, no one looks at your data in a um, meaningful way. But there'll be algorithms that can run on top of your data that can still provide you utility. And there are many flavors out there. Um, there's federated learning, there's differential privacy, secure multi-party computation, and homomorphic encryption. I'll start with federated learning. And these are just techniques. They can all be combined and used, or, but, but I want to get the concepts individually explained. So when you look at Apple, you use a lot of Siri, right? You would think that when you talk to Siri, the data gets collected by Apple servers. It processes it, it learns about it, and then it gives you recommendations. That's not the case. Apple moved away from that model. So when you talk to Siri, your data is only on your device. Apple does not take your data out. What Apple does is it ships its machine learning model to your devices to train the model on your devices and makes it private for you. There are a bunch of other companies that do something similar. Uh, Google, when you type in Google and when you get these auto recommendations for words, it's actually, uh, again, privately stored on your device. Google does not have access to data. This type of a model where you're not collecting data, but you are pushing your code to the edge devices is called federated learning. So you train your ML model in a distributed manner on different devices without collecting the data in a central repository. It's very simple to understand the steps. You have a central uh, repository or central location that has a machine learning model. You push the model to all the edge devices where you want to train the data. The, the edge devices will locally train that data, update the parameters, and then the parameters ship back to the central location. 
so that the model gets updated and um, you can learn the parameters. As you can imagine, there are several advantages to this because only the model gets exchanged between the devices. You never have access to the data and it's compliant. So if you think about GDP and other things, uh, it's only the model gets shipped. So you do not really get the data from these countries. And that's why it's, it's very compliant. And it's, it's the simplest way to explore privacy preserving computation. But there are disadvantages as well. The number one is people have a bunch of devices that have different compute capabilities. Your model may not be able to train well on those devices. So you may not be able to give a good user experience. And the bigger one is leaky abstractions. Even by sniffing the parameters that these devices update in your model, people can actually guess. There are algorithms that can guess the ML model, which is your core algorithm. You want to remove those leaky abstractions as well. So this is a, a great example where this could actually be used. You have hospitals, like I said, you can train data, um, train local data in these hospitals by a machine learning model, and then use the same model to predict whether or not a, a disease is something that's been seen in other places. And this paper actually covers the case where there is leakage from federated learning. So federated learning is simple, but there are leakages and we need to move from this. Before um, getting further into what other techniques are there, um, one thing to realize is that there, is, there was no framework to measure how much privacy you're compromising when you share your data. So the next major concept is differential privacy. Differential privacy itself is not an algorithm or any technique. It's just a framework to tell the customer or the user, this is the amount of privacy you're willing to compromise to get this utility. So the way to explain differential privacy is um, it's, you will, the claim is that you will not be affected adversely or otherwise by allowing your data to be used in any study or analysis, no matter what other studies, data sets or information sources are available. It's a long line, so I'll just simplify it for everyone. Let's say, and this is a very simplistic explanation. Let's say we want to know the average amount everyone has in their pocket in this room. Okay, one technique is I just ask all of you, give me the answer and I'll compute the average. The other is I ask you to add a random number, plus or minus $20 to it. Now, let's say someone has $30, so they'll add some random number. Someone has 40, they'll add a random number. You may wonder, like, can I get an average if everyone just adds random noise? But there is a law of large numbers that says that as the sample size grows, the noise effectively cancels out. So you can come and converge to the average. A very simple way to preserve privacy, but also get to the answer. That's what differential privacy allows. We are adding some noise to the data to get to the answer that is within reasonable limits. But one thing to note is that this requires scale. So you need to, this only works with larger set. It will, it will not work when the set is smaller. Um, the key query that differential privacy tries to solve for is if you have a data set that has a lot of rows, if you remove a single entity from that data set, does it impact the final answer of a query or not? If it does not, that, that means that person's information is inherently protected because they're not affecting the result of the computation. So um, this is a very simple way to model the same thing. You have a database that has n entries, you run a query, you get a result, you remove any entry, and if you run the same query, and if you get almost similar result, your privacy is protected. Uh, otherwise, your privacy is compromised. So what does differential privacy promise as a framework? It promises to protect individuals from any additional harm that they might face because the data is in a private database X than what they would not have faced if their data had not been a part of X. It tries to measure this by a term called epsilon, which is a threshold of uh, differential privacy. But what it does not promise is, if you think your data is a secret, it will not promise that it will keep it a secret because it's not a security technique, it's a privacy framework. So differential priv privacy can only exist for privacy. You still need security to coexist with it. Um, and differential privacy is used in many, uh, many places. Um, so Google Chrome 
used, uh, uses differential privacy to understand the frequently visited pages. Apple uses it to discover, um, to learn about emojis and words so that they can build more NLP um, technologies. And Microsoft uh, uses this to learn about the telemetry data of their operating systems. The US Census Bureau used differential privacy in the 2020 census. But there are um, disadvantages to it as well. There were researchers that looked into Apple's claim of using differential privacy and found that uh, the threshold that I was talking about, the epsilon value that allows you, that gives you a measure of how much privacy you're willing to compromise to get a utility. Apple did not publicly publish that uh, epsilon value. And it was found after like, you know, you break into the code and understand this, that that epsilon value is very high, which means that although Apple claimed to be, uh, to be working on technologies that were differentially private, they actually leaked a lot of privacy. Um, but at least they're doing great work in this field. So the next topic is um, secure multi-party computation. Um, like I said, federated learning is not enough because there are leaky abstractions there. But secure multi-party computation is a very, very upcoming field where a lot of companies have sprung up trying to solve um, the SMPC problem in the blockchain arena. Um, what it does is, again, similar to it allows multiple parties to perform some computation uh, and receive the result without exposing any party's private data. Um, an example to make it simpler to understand. Let's say we want to compute the average salary of three people, right? Uh, you have A, B, and C. Um, you can look at all of their data, the private data, and then compute it. But let's say we want to use SMPC. We do not want to expose their private data. So what you do is every person's average salary you shred it into pieces and you distribute it amongst uh, the participants. So 100 was split into 50, 30, and 20. 200 was split into minus 80, 100, and 180. Similarly, 300 was 0, 350, and minus 50. Now, A has shares from the other two participants without actually knowing the exact data that they have. It's the next step is if you have to compute the average, you just average out all of them. You, you sum all of them and you can sum the result, and that's your average. So this way, what you've done is, you had data, you had a query, you split the data in a way that by itself did not make sense to any participant. But then the participants communicated with each other to sum up the data, and you still got your result back. That is what secure multi-party computation does. And this is a very simple example. It's not, it's not this simple. Um, but the idea is you have data that, uh, is encrypted and you would say for lack of a better term horcruxed if you if you're a harry potter fan um, you will then split it into parts and uh, distribute it and then let these individual parts run some compute let them communicate with each other and then you get the result back from it um, so the blueprint for multi-party computation is this you securely encode the data and you use some form of a share algorithm that does secret sharing. Uh, you compute, and then you reconstruct the encoded results back. Now, um, uh, if you think about uh, like polynomials, I, most of us m may remember it, but I'll just give a refresher. Let's say you have a plane, and you have a single point. There can be infinite number of lines that pass through that one point. But let's say I give you two points. There can only be one line that passes through two points. Now let's extend this further. If I give you three points, there is a degree three polynomial that can pass through that, and there's only one polynomial that can do that. So if you think about your secret, let's say I want, I want to encode a number 10. That's my secret, right? Um, and I want to uh, encode that, but not allow the participants to know that secret. So what I do is I draw a random polynomial where the y-axis, if you see here, um, when um, the x is 0, the secret is encoded on the y-axis. I make a polynomial that passes through it. And now I pick random points in my plane. Those are my secrets that I'll share. And for a degree t polynomial, uh, and I'll repeat this, for a degree t polynomial, you need at least t plus 1 points to reconstruct your secret back. So if I have n participants, I need to make sure that at least t plus 1 are participants that I trust. They are not malicious actors. 
So when I get the data back from them, I can reconstruct the polynomial and I can know my secret. But each point on its own cannot do anything. Even if you throw a lot of compute to it, it cannot really compute the secret because there could be infinite number of polynomials that pass through that point. So that's the idea behind Shamir secret sharing. Uh, so Shamir is the same guy who is a, who um, was a part of the RSA algorithm, if you know that. The S is the Shamir guy. Um, so like I said, anything less than the threshold, you cannot really reconstruct it. And this is called information theoretically secure because uh, there are a lot of studies that say that when quantum computing uh, comes to the fore, a lot of systems will break. Uh, but if a system is marked as ITS secure, which is information theoretically secure, even quantum computers cannot break it. And this technique of SMPC is powerful because it is ITS secure. And like I said, it, it relies on polynomial interpolation. You encode the secret into a polynomial and you split into pieces and distribute it. Uh, there are many advantages to SMPC. It actually promotes the vision of privacy and utility. Um, and unlike federated learning, it only reveals the final result. So you do not have intermediate parameters being shipped to a central location. It is less resource intensive compared to the next technique that we'll talk about, um, which is homomorphic encryption. But there are disadvantages. If you have a million participants, like in a blockchain network, you have so many nodes. And if they're all communicating with each other, you're really gated by the latency of communication. So you need to um, figure out ways to avoid these participants from communicating with each other, but also still be able to compute and converge to a result. There, are, there is a lot of active research in this area, but this is one of the disadvantages of SMPC, why it's not publicly being used everywhere. And the other one is um, you can have colluding parties, uh, you can have malicious actors, and you need at least T plus one uh, actors to be correct and not malicious. Uh, so in the presence of malicious actors, you really can't do much with SMPC. <clears throat> and finally, homomorphic encryption. Um, so homomorphic encryption is um, very, um, it's again, simple to understand, but very complicated to implement, like with any technology. Um, you make uh, your and you still can do math on it. A simple way to understand is today when you uh, work with cloud technologies, you have your data, you encrypt your data, you upload it to cloud. Let's say you want to edit your data. You have to bring the data back. You have to decrypt it, edit it, re-encrypt it, push it to cloud again. Now that's a hassle. What if there was a way to edit something that lives in cloud without actually decrypting it? There are two advantages to it. One is, first of all, you don't have to ship the data back change it and again send it back. There's a lot of cost for egress. The second advantage is there is a window of vulnerability when you decrypt something because that's plain text bytes and anyone can sniff that data. So you want to reduce the probability of anyone sniffing the data and that's why you want it in an always encrypted format. So if what if you could run computation on encrypted data? What this means is if I have two numbers, 10 and 20, let's say, and I encrypt 10 and I encrypt 20 and I get some random numbers because I've encrypted them. The sum of those encryptions, encrypted bytes, should be the same as if I had just summed up 10 and 20 and encrypted the result. So what that means is you want to implement an addition function such that encryption of number one plus encryption of number two is equal to the encryption of number one plus two. That's the addition part. The multiplication part can also be solved like that. So that's what homomorphic encryption aims to do. Um, the idea is that the operations on encrypted data and then decrypting the result is equivalent to operations without encryption. And there are various types of homomorphic encryptions. Uh, there's a partial homomorphic encryption that allows select mathematical functions to run unlimited number of times. And addition is a simple example. You can keep running addition any number of times. That's the partial homomorphic encryption part. The other one is somewhat homomorphic encryption where you can only run an operation a limited number of times. And the reason why you cannot run something unlimited number of times is because of noise. When you encrypt something, you actually add some noise to it. Now if you imagine you're, you have noise added to the first number, noise added to the second number. 
when you add them, the noise is additive. But when you multiply them, the noise has a multiplicative effect. And if the noise rises above a threshold, you cannot decrypt the data. So you need to periodically reset the noise levels to zero so that you're able to decrypt that data. And that's why homomorphic en encryption is challenging. And finally, the fully homomorphic encryption, which is the holy grail. This is our ideal goal in life. Bless you. Uh, we want to get to a point where we can uh, have a fully homomorphic encrypted system where you can do any operation any number of times. Like I said, the homomorphic part uh, implies that the following relationships should hold true. When you encrypt numbers individually um, and sum them, the answer should be the same as if you summed the plain text bytes and then encrypted the result. Uh, homomorphic encryption is actually used in some private machine learning applications. CryptoNets is a great example. Uh, it uses fully homomorphic encryption with neural networks. And like I said, handling noise is very, very complicated in homomorphic encryption and that is partially the reason why it hasn't taken off. Um, I think that once we figure out algorithms that can deal with noise in a better manner, there are uh, many opportunities uh, to leverage homomorphic encryption. So why don't we use it? Um, it's impractically slow to do this. Um, in fact, IBM released their HE uh, lib C++ uh, library in 2016, and one of the engineer, engineers said that it was a trillion times slower than plain text. You can expect an engineer to use that word. Uh, but now it's down to 75 times slow, so we're making progress. Um, Microsoft released a library, a simple encrypted arithmetic library, uh, which is, uh, it's actually pretty good. The interfaces are good. Uh, and this is the idea behind homomorphic encryption again. Like it's the same thing. You, you want to work on encrypted data, but not expose the data. So after all of this, after all that I said right now, what next? Like why am I talking about all this? Um, the, the, the thing is that um, if we have to build systems in the future that solve problems that we all have to face uh, in our world, bless you, uh, then we need to have ways to preserve the privacy as well as not compromise generating algorithms on top of data. Um, and what is holding us back is computational resources that are used by these techniques. Um, and for fully homomorphic encryption, it's very aspirational, uh, but there is, no, there is very poor user experience. Um, and this is because uh, really it, there are many libraries out there that claim to be FHE, but there's no clear interface, um, and there is no benchmarks, benchmarking. So you don't know what you're using, how, how much faster or slower it is, um, and there is absolutely zero interoperability. So all of them developed it in silos, uh, and they claim that they are doing the best thing. Um, and because it's very complicated to implement addition and multiplication, some people try to do it bitwise, some people try to, do, try to use modulo arithmetic to do it, it's very, um, very difficult to model this. And so there are different libraries that do that. But in order to use any library, you really need to study a lot. That's not how libraries should be. You should be able to plug it into your system and you should be able to use them. That's the gap that exists today. That's why it's not being used very actively. Um, and with SMPC, there is lots of message exchange. So there are techniques to remove these message exchanges by uh, removing consensus and you can check out Nillion. That's doing some work on that aspect. Uh, what it does is it splits the secret sharing uh, and makes potentially SMPC commercially viable. Ideally, what you want is a mix of secure multi-party computation with fully homomorphic encryption. And you also want a framework like differential privacy to quantify the risks that someone's taking when they, when they give out your data, their data. <sighs> That's my talk. Thank you so much for joining me today. So the, uh, I'll repeat the question, um, is addition and are addition and multiplications the only operations that are supported or that are being researched for FHE? Uh, yes, they are the only ones because uh, according to the researchers, if you model those two correctly, then you can model everything around it. It's similar to how you can model any gate using the NAND gate or the NOR gate. Um, in the same way, you can have steps of additions and multiplications that can actually result in any algorithm being translated to that. So that's the reason that they focused on only these two. Yes. That's a good question. Um, so the question is, how does uh, the work on privacy um, like, you know, extend to explainable AI? Like, how does that relate to explainable AI? I think um, 
privacy is a very touchy topic because um, everyone wants privacy, but no one wants uh, to lose out on utility. Um, and so this is way far off from anything that's explainable just because the research itself is so complicated for this. So it's, uh, and for privacy, uh, unlike AI, AI, you probably do not know the inputs. You do not know what model to train. So you, want, you expect to know patterns. But in privacy, you have data, you have statistics. You know that the inputs are these, th th these particular uh, data sets that is encrypted or not encrypted in plain text format. Um, and you really need to use techniques that can work on the input data that you've been given. So in that sense, it's sort of slightly different than like AI. Uh, but I would say that it falls within the same bucket of categories where you have um, systems that learn about your data without, or that can operate on your data without learning about your data. So in that way, it's related. Uh, that's a good question. Um, so the question is, um, can uh, parties not come together and decrypt data or like make sense of data? Uh, I mean, mostly you expect there to be malicious actors. So you really want to avoid the case where you have um, parties coming together to decrypt the data. There are asymmetric encryption techniques that allow you to encrypt using public key, but you can just decrypt using a private key. Um, those are the techniques that generally are being uh, explored right now. But all of what I've spoken about today exists only with symmetric key encryptions, which means you use the same key to encrypt that you use to decrypt. There are There is research right now for asymmetric encryption techniques over SMPC and other um, technologies that I discussed, but I'm not actually aware if, if that's the yes, case. Yes, yeah. Yeah. yes. yes. Um, you, because it's symmetric encryption, you have to trust the party that it's not decrypting using the key. But if you think about cloud systems uh, and the key management services that you use with, let's say, AWS, you always have the option of client-side encryption where you keep the encryption key with yourself as a client. AWS never knows about it. And then what happens is AWS is always like, they, it's just a plain text of bytes. Um, they'll do their work, they'll do the compute, they'll return the result back, and you can decrypt using a key. So this works with client-side encryption. Okay, so it's not for them to do any study on the data. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That, that's, that's right. But if you if you think about asymmetric uh, encryption, yeah. where uh, this is possible that the supplier of the data may not be the one that wants to know the result, right. and you can have public private key uh, encryption that can allow that to happen. So it that there's still a way to get around that problem. So It, it, there's active research right now. I mean, it's not being used in practice right now, but yes, in principle, in theory, it can work with that. Whatever libraries are out there today only work with symmetric encryption, though. But there's nothing stopping us from developing a library that can work with asymmetric. Yes, um, that's, a, that's a great question. And that's, that's how I got started into this journey of understanding this. So um, that's the problem with blockchain. You can look at a wallet. You can look at all the transactions made out of the wallet. A lot of, uh, the good thing is a lot of criminals got caught because of this. Now the bad thing is all the good actors also unnecessarily get sniffed. So uh, I don't know if anyone has heard about Zcash. Zcash is this alternative to uh, Bitcoin. What they used was ZK Snarks. ZK Snarks is a technology which is um, zero knowledge proof, um, which means a very simple example to understand this is you go to a bar to get a drink, uh, you have to show your ID. When you're showing your ID, you really just need to prove that you are eligible, your age, that's it. Uh, and that's all that they care about. But you inadvertently show them your driver's license number, your address, and everything. Zero knowledge proof allows two parties, the prover and the verifier, to come to an understanding what, that whatever the prover is claiming is true without revealing any of the input secrets. So there's a series of questions that the verifier can ask the prover in one model, where the verifier will keep asking questions and the prover will keep responding. And at some point, the verifier is like, yeah, this person seems to be the person that, or whatever statement they're making seems to be true. That is what zero knowledge proofs do. So Zcash started with ZK snarks, which is zero knowledge, succinct, non-interactive, non something, something, something. The idea was that uh, you can use the zero knowledge proof, but the catch was, before you start all this um, conversation between the verifier and the prover, there is a lot of um, pre-building stage. You need to like prepare the environment where none of them is malicious and all of that. 
So that is why ZK snarks are not being used right now. What is being used is called ZK starks. So ZK, S-T-A-R-K, that is being used right now, um, which avoids this pre-build phase completely. So that is a way in which um, alternative blockchains are exploring, hiding users' private data and not exposing it. So you, know, you never know what the transactions are. So that's how they're doing. Uh, so for, the malicious, for a malicious actor to um, exist, you need, it needs to have the key, uh, the key to decrypt the data. Um, and so you have uh, key management techniques today that can avoid having the secret out. So homomorphic encryption, again, is not a security primitive. It's a privacy primitive. You still need to have the authentication in place. What homomorphic does is, given that your data is av available on cloud, the cloud cannot sniff that data. It, it has access to data because you've given it access. You've given it your data. But they can't read your data. That's what these encryption techniques allow. But you still need the basic security primitives to avoid your secret key being released out there or for someone to get it. If someone has access to the, your secret key, then they can definitely read the decrypted results. So it doesn't prevent that. So addition and multiplication are, you can think of it as overloaded functions. You really have to implement what addition means for strings, what addition and multiplication means for different data types. So integers were simple to start with because it's easier to reason about integers and adding them. But again, addition is not a simple plain text addition. It's like you need to un like get every bit, add every bit, use modular arithmetic and all of that for integers. Strings would be the next level of complexity. And then we'll build primitives for other data types as well. Yes, I think I'm on time. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you.